You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts Uncle Mike Tussaud from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. That rock and tune means it's time yet again for the option block everyone's favorite i know it's my favorite hopefully it's your favorite as well bi-weekly source for all things options related a little bit of wit a little bit of wisdom a sprinkling of hilarity we'll get to that in a second <laughs> some unusual activity a whole bunch of other fun stuff we swirl it all together and you get the tasty and delicious brew that is the option block my name is mark longo from the optionsinsider.com as well as the ever expanding options insider radio network i'm laughing because we launched yesterday the 15th edition to the network and it is a silly one listeners if you thought you wanted a little dose of silly with your options talk or indeed your business talk well we got you covered with the aforementioned business show very very imaginatively named if you if you it's worth listening alone just for the opening intro music it's it's fantastic that that may be my favorite part of the show but it's it's been uh, pretty well received so far improv comedy with a business flair had special guests like elon musk in quotes and others i believe donald trump uh, elon musk was mentioned donald trump was quote unquote a special guest on the show so check it out uh right now it's available in our network feed it'll soon be available standalone in all of your favorite places itunes tune in stitcher so on and so forth wherever you find our other fine programs including this week in futures options and indeed the option block all of our 500 plus episodes of that program so check them out if you are so inclined you want a good chuckle or maybe just shake your head in disgust either way this show is good for that, so check it out. All right, and joining me on the old program today, uh, one of the, the uh, quote-unquote masterminds behind the aforementioned business show, uh, the greasy meatball himself coming in via way of the land known as the pit, Mr. Mark Sebastian. Mark, welcome back to the program, and congratulations on the launch of your new baby, the business show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I, you know, we're excited. We've got some huge guests coming up. We've got... Uh, J the Jimmy John, the founder of Jimmy John's. We've got, uh, you know, a couple of good analysts coming up, some important analysts. We've got uh, all, all sorts of people. It's a, uh, you know, and and it's it's uh, it's a fun little project, and you know, it's it's nice because uh, you get to see how the uh, the sausage is made, Mark. Uh, it's one of the few times he ever kicks back and just sits in and enjoys one of uh, a show on his network as opposed to having to run it. So. Uh, yeah, if you, if you haven't listened to it yet, make sure you check it out. And then uh, check out our our uh, our uh, Twitter handle, at GetBusiness. And uh, go to GetBusiness.com. We'll start posting some things here. And I think at some point we'll, st we'll get our own uh, iTunes feed. But I think you have to wait for approval for approval from those guys before that happens. Yeah, you got to get the maestros to bless you with the magic Apple wand and uh, that takes a little bit of time, a little bit faster for us, but uh, we'll get it done. Well, so check it out, listeners. Business. I'm still chuckling over that intro theme. So you're right, and I, I'm I am blameless, listeners. If you don't like it, I am blameless. If uh, if you love it, then I am indeed the force behind the scenes. So either way, I get to win on this one, which is kind of fun. Also joining me on the old show today is beaming in from that scenic, quiet little hamlet known as St. Charles, Illinois, where it's always a lovely and temperate. 75.6 degrees mr uncle mike tusa from rcm wealth advisors uncle mike welcome back to the old program sir 
Always happy to be here. And what is the difference between a Hamlet and a duchy? Duchy is, I think of a duchy as, as a little bit bigger, a little bit grander. Uh, there's usually some sort of duke involved, so there's some sort of royal lineage. A Hamlet's just a little kind of quiet, sleepy area, usually kind of provincial. And uh, I don't think there's a lot of royalty or nobility involved. Certainly lower than the duke level, which is pretty high up there next to king. So uh, there you go. That's my, that's my basic two-cent understanding of, uh, of royal decrees and lineage and uh, ancestral ties. If, the, if someone else takes umbrage, feel free to write in with your, your true definition of a duchy versus a Hamlet. <laughs> Hot debates here on the old option block. All right, it's time to get to it. It's time to get right into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, everybody, welcome to The Trading Block. Like the name implies, this is indeed the portion of the program where we break down what was moving, what was shaking, what was rocking, what was rolling in today's activity. Been a bit of a weird week. Uh, we had, of course, uh, FOMC earlier in the week. In fact, yesterday, as we're recording this, listeners, and streaming it live on Thursday, June 16th, right around 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern. So we're a day or so removed from the big FOMC announcement and the market, at least slightly likened uh, what they saw today, a slight rally on the old street, most of the major indices, finishing the day up about, oh, about three-tenths of a percent. But that kind of belies uh, the story where we did have quite a range intraday, a low on the S&P of about, oh, about 20 half or so. So getting back down there. So about a good uh, and a high about 20, nearly 20, 80. So nearly, nearly a 30 handle range. So a wee bit of, uh, of rocking and rolling out there in good old, uh, in good old index land. Uh, Qs and Dow all finishing up uh, slightly on the day. The Dow up about half a percent. So leading the day on the finishing upward charge. And even though we saw a lot of back and forth today, uh, VIX Cash taking a bit of a breather at about 19.3. But that kind of also belies kind of the tale of this week because we were talking uh, earlier in the week on Monday how, and indeed last week on this show and on Volatility Views, how how the response was kind of muted, it seemed like, early on from a VIX and volatility perspective. We had a lot of lingering things on the horizon. FOMC this week, Brexit coming down the road. Uh, seemed like the market should be a little bit more concerned than it was. And then all of a sudden this week, they kind of awakened to that fact. And we saw the VIX cash skyrocketing north up uh, nearly 50% to use a percent of percent. I know Mr. Sebastian hates that. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, hovering up above the 20 handle. And then post FOMC, remaining above the 20 handle until today, kind of break through the south side again kind of showing that the concern not really so much with the FOMC uh, that that one kind of in the rearview mirror before it even came along they were pricing in a very low probability of any sort of hike uh, in the June meeting and that probability extends out pretty far looking at uh, the Fed watch tool from our friends over there at CME July probability about seven percent SEP south of a third about 29 percent November still south of a third only 31 percent you got to go all the way out to D's to get even close to a coin flip about 47 percent so people pricing in not a heck of a lot of movement from the Fed at least for the remainder of the year so there's still a lot of elevated volatility out there clearly Brexit on the minds of a lot of folks as we approach that uh, Feb, excuse me, June 23rd deadline. A lot of interesting stuff. Had a good debate about that today on a long and short of futures options. Check that out on our network coming soon. In the meantime, though, let's turn our attention. Let's start. Greasy Meatball has been on a little while. Let's have Greasy Meatball. What are your thoughts, sir, on uh, today's activity and indeed uh, the week that is so far in FOMC? I mean, what a turnaround. And, uh, you know, the. It's shocking that somebody getting a le a political leader getting assassinated, which is what happened today, uh, could cause a market rally, and that is what happened. This Miss Cox got um, assassinated for her uh, her belief in in the Britons staying as a part of the EU, and now we see that the market rallied because. Uh, I guess the belief is that sentiment changed with her her death, and you know maybe it woke people up that there was a lot more issues with uh, a leave vote than than maybe they had thought about before, and and who was leading it. It was, uh, I mean, just shocking. But yeah, Vol came in uh, still above 19 percent, still juiced, and then we saw the market rally from down 20 to up six. 
So people looking at the end of the day, yeah, market was up six today. They don't realize how close to off the rails things really did get this morning. At a, at a certain point, I mean, it looked like we were going to be down 40. It was that kind of a day. And, of course, you know, we ended up not having that at all. So just kind of a shocking day. Yeah, shocking all around. I didn't, I didn't even get into the uh, the ramifications of, of course, the. Uh, it seems like there's tragic events abound these days, whether it's here domestically or uh, overseas in uh, Britain. Clearly, the debate about so that vote getting uh, far more heated, to put it mildly, with uh, the assassination of, uh, I believe, that MP over there. Uh, so, yeah, crazy, crazy stuff, and that being felt in the markets today as well. Uncle Mike, take us away from this dark talk. Uh, what caught your eyes in today's activity, sir? Well, everything. I agree with what Mark said and that it was a very volatile day. I remember just watching the uh, markets at the open about an hour in. Uh, we're down in the... Uh, 2050s, or I'm sorry, the 205 level, uh, again, an SPY. And uh, so, so with that, the magnet continues, the 205 magnet again with SPY. It seems like it's a rule. It has to be in the 205s in some way, shape, or form. Uh, but, yeah, once that happened and we rallied, uh, it was definitely a great day to be a day trader. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind on the markets today would be uh, we've been down, I believe it's six days in a row at this point. So as I'm looking at it, it would be something's got to give at some point, uh, you'd think. Uh, but we have been getting pounded these last few days. And so you know, maybe this is the catalyst with which it would go. Uh, in regard to the shiny stuff, gold, uh, an interesting thing that I saw, uh, me being the, the deep-rooted technician with which I am not, uh, but I guess I am a technician, the official technician of this show. Uh, and looking at GLD, uh, GLD went up to uh, high of the day today with GLD was uh, 125.67. Uh, we're right around a level with which we had back in January. And when GLD did touch that, we did start to come down a little bit on the day. So uh, with that, just something to be careful with with GLD at this point. Uh, it's had a nice little run over the course of the last uh, week or so. Uh, but we did hit a level today, and we were not able to get through it. So uh, tread cautiously in GLD land at this point. No. Uh, granted, there's a lot of things going on. Uh, who knows whether it's really technical or whether it's just Sebastian doing his play account. Who knows? It could be that. But uh, the point is that we did touch a level of resistance on it, and uh, I would recommend treading cautiously. Uh, overall, in the marketplace, uh, there's really... Uh, not a lot of individual names on my personal radar screen that are uh, really making anything, any type of big news. Oil is pulling back a little bit, but uh, aside from that, on the individual names with which I watch, uh, nothing too significant uh, to go with outside of the, the macro news, which is uh, the word that we all love to say, Brexit. Sounds really fun. It's fun to say, isn't it? It is a fun word to say, even if it is uh, way overused. And I, I, I tried to avoid it for as long as I could on the network. But here, coming into these uh, final weeks ahead of the vote, it's kind of impossible. Uh, Speaking of uh, Brexit, that was our listener question of the week last week. This week, we decided with Vol skyrocketing starting at the beginning of the week. I thought, hey, I would crowdsource myself a little uh, crystal ball duty for Vol Views tomorrow, and I would ask our listeners, our audience, uh, where do they feel uh, that uh, VIX is going to close on Friday? So, of course, we had FOMC baked into that on Wednesday, and then, of course, we have the looming specter of Brexit on the horizon. So, Uncle Mike, I'll start with you. A, or I'll, give you the, I'll give you the choices first, so then you could vote and, and then also say what you think is winning. The choices are the 18 to 20 range, the 15 to 17.99 range, uh, above 20 or below 15. So first off, where is your guess? And then B, what do you think is winning in our poll? Uh, and this is for the close tomorrow, correct? Yeah, tomorrow, Friday. I'll go with above 20 on both counts. I think that's what everyone's saying, and that's what I will go with. Above 20 on both counts. Interesting. Mr. Greasy Meatball, where are you, where are you following here, sir? Uh, I'm going to say below 20 on both counts. That's not an option. You can say below 15. <laughs> You could say, it's not the over-under. <laughs> yeah, I know. You could say 18 to 20. You could say 15 to 17.99 or above 20. I'll, I mean, I, I, I'll say, uh, I'll say, uh, I'll say 17 to 18. 17, that's right. Well, I going to get pounded that bad tomorrow. I think, I think we could be at 18 tomorrow. 
So I'm going to put you in the 18 to 20 range then, because that's, that's one of our choices. Uh, and uh, all right, so yeah, the winner is not above 20, even though when we, when we put this poll out there, I believe, uh, the, I think the VIX wa cash was uh, certainly well lower than it is right now. Uh, I'll have to pull up exactly where it was, but it was not, uh, it was not threatening the specter of uh, of a 20 when as of the writing of this but um uh, yeah it was uh, so we we put it out there and when the winner actually is the 15 to 17.99 range nearly half of voters so far i still got another day or so left because we couldn't close it before the friday closed uh so uh, get your votes in if you haven't voted already uh, about a quarter saying above 20 so a quarter feeling the love that was there earlier this week they were right until about earlier this afternoon about 20 percent in the 18 to 20 range and just a tick under 10 percent nine percent in the below 15 range so people uh selling all of that Brexit ball out there, which is kind of interesting. So yeah, a lot of people thinking uh, this is perhaps a wee bit overdone. Things are looking a wee bit juicy. We were talking some of our other programs uh, this morning, how, uh, you know, skew, depending on, no, it doesn't matter where you look. I don't care if you look at Spy, you look at, you know, your E-mini, you look wherever you look, SPX, uh, skew is rich, skew is hefty, about the 90 plus percentile across the board in all of those products. Uh, clearly, uh, clearly rich from a put side. And maybe if you are indeed fading Brexit, Seems like a lot of our listeners are doing that because uh, given our poll results uh, from last week, then uh, if you're fading Brexit, then this might be an opportunity for you to, uh, to get some of that good, good juice before it is indeed gone. And this is actually usually the time I want to talk about a few more things before we roll on into the odd block. We've got like a bit of a, I think, an extended odd block today because I want to talk about one of the... Uh, one of the big stories that's been lighting it up this week from an unusual activity perspective. I don't usually see these bandied about that often, but uh, this one's kind of been going back and forth a lot this week, and we touched on it a little bit earlier this week. Let's get a little bit longer, more into it now with the Odd Block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by theoptionsinsider.com. It's time for the Odd Block. Everybody, welcome to the Odd Block. This is indeed the portion of the program where we break down some of the weirder, the wilder, sometimes just stranger paper uh, that is lighting it up in the old options market today. But actually, we're not going to talk about today right now. We're going to kick things off, dialing back the needle to last Friday. Uh, this was, of course, uh, the, the close before the big, a lot of things happening at the beginning of the week. It seems like almost an eternity since the Microsoft LinkedIn deal was announced. And that deal has kind of been overshadowed by just about everything else that's been happening this week is leading into the FOMC. And now, of course, Brexit and the horrible news out of, uh, out of, uh, out of, out of Britain today. So it's just been a, a, a week of, of spiraling news. And the announcement at the beginning of the week kind of got lost in the shuffle. Uh, and, of course, there was a flurry of speculation coming out of that deal that some shenanigans were afoot out there in the old, uh, in the old LinkedIn Microsoft deal. In particular, uh, I think it was Fortune first came out and uh, writing up a big article about how someone was gobbling up a bunch of upside. I believe it was the AUG 160s and the AUG 175s. And it looked like that person on paper was sitting on about a $2 million profit. Uh, we actually, that, that came out right before we started doing the show on Monday. So we actually touched on it on the show on Monday, of course, before we had time to really spend a lot of time digging into the paper. As soon as we got off the show, I started looking into it. And I saw a lot of people on Twitter were kind of looking into that as well. And there was a lot of questioning about what actually went up around that time. So if you dig a little bit more, you can see that there actually was a lot of other paper going on at that same time, all kind of tied together for the most part, all going up about the same time. And uh, it was a little bit more than it seemed to be on the surface. And, you know, it wasn't just a straight up call by. It actually, when you dig together, it seemed like uh, the paper was actually more of a bit of a funky slash broken ring slash ratio uh, iron condor. So the paper wasn't just coming in buying the 160s in August and then make a ton of money and buying the 175s. It actually was, uh, he was selling the 160s and buying, excuse me, and buying the 185s and then turning around and selling 
which wasn't mentioned in the Fortune article, uh, selling the 125 puts, doing that 600 times, and buying the 115 puts, hence uh, the funky iron condor there. Uh, so the put spread obviously doing well. He had a ratio there, did more on the puts. That one he prop- pocketed, probably that was about worthless as of a couple of days ago because, uh, of course, the stock uh, took off to the races as a result. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's looking at a p- couple hundred grand. I think he pocketed off that one. But, of course, those were dwarfed on the sale of that call spread, uh, which is looking uh, pretty aggressive, 20-plus handles <laughs> against him now on uh, that one. So that one's going to leave a bit of a mark, I believe, somewhere in the neighborhood of about $1.2 million, uh, depending on where he can close that bad boy out for. So, yeah, it wasn't exactly the win. And also a bit of a head-scratcher, too, because if you know anything about options and you know that you think a big event's coming up in the near term, Short iron fl- condor, not exactly my first go-to bit of strategy that I would employ. Uh, it's really uh, a strategy for where you want something to really go nowhere fast and uh, not as aggressive as an iron fly, but still along those same lines. And uh, so someone thinking that they knew something, perhaps, or just either that or just one of the worst time trades I've seen in a while. Uh, either way, it seems like uh, that, uh, that was the case. Of course, uh, I think Bloomberg followed up a day or two later with another article kind of slamming Fortune about that, and Fortune pushing back now saying it was an iron condor, but there, were, there was other stuff going on, and they kind of it's been a lot of sturm and drang, which is kind of fun to see in the unusual activity space. Uh, and there was some other kind of stuff that was a little bit funky. There was some call buying a few weeks before that may or may not have been questionable, but uh, that stuff's a little bit harder to uh, pin down versus the very, very last minute stuff that went up on Friday. And of course, uh, the 175s uh, were a bit funky as well because they went up at a bunch of different prints in 100 lots and the stock was kind of bouncing all over at the time. So where they went up on the bid ass spread and everything else was a little bit uh, a little bit dubious there. So that could have been all right in that trade, but it is still kind of hard to fathom someone will come in, blast out this iron condor, and then also at the same time be picking up these calls. It was a weird one either way, but it definitely wasn't as, as it appears on the surface perhaps a good cautionary tale for everyone who tries to dive into unusual activity. That's why we spend so much time on this stuff on the show, uh, because it often isn't as it appears on the surface. It is kind of weird that Fortune uh, would forget the put leg on this and the upside call leg, because they all went up at the exact same time on any, any cursory search on any platform. I don't care, live ball, a trade alert, I don't care what you're looking at. It's going to tell you they all printed at the same time. Uh, so uh, it's kind of interesting to see that uh, they kind of just pulled out that little bit of activity. Uh, to focus on. But again, that's the danger of, uh, of unusual activity. Sometimes you will get burnt. Uh, Mr. Greasy Meatball, have you been following this kind of back and forth? Anybody talking about it in your pitch chat? And what are your thoughts on what seemed like a home run call by, dubious call by, now seemed to be a very poorly timed iron, iron fly sale, uh, excuse me, iron condor sale? Yeah, it looks just like it was just ill advised and, and not well executed. And, you know, sometimes big paper is not smart and they're just trying to make some money here and there. And it was poorly timed i mean if you look at the volatility of linkedin prior to that the implied vol was way i mean if i was running an iron condor scanner prior to this announcement this would have been all over it right because the the iv was high and the realized vol low i mean mike isn't that like one of the th- when you're doing iron condors what do you look for stocks aren't moving much that have a high iv and and that's that's maybe what this guy was doing yeah i don't see any other reason why that would be so <clears throat> It's um, sometimes you get burned really, 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 really badly at this. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's just it. It's funny you mentioned that because I kind of had a similar thought when I was looking at this. I was like, what if this is just some poor schmo who was running a scanner or something like that? Because you're right, the setup was kind of favorable for it going into this. And he just had the uh, absolute worst timing uh, on the planet to get caught up in this thing. And uh, now he's being accused of insider trading and everything else like that. So it's a loss on just about every way you could imagine it right now. Uh, but you're right. I could certainly see that. I mean, it's, this wasn't like, you're not talking 10,000 contracts. It wasn't institutional size. This was 500 and 600 contracts. Decent size, obviously, but not to, not beyond the reach of your average mere mortals. And so uh, kind of interesting interesting stuff here to watch. And again, shows how uh, how dangerous it is to play with fire out here on the dark side of the options market. We're going to do it anyway, though, because we like to do it. We like to boldly go where others fear to tread into the realm. This time, let's move away from LinkedIn and social networking into one of my old favorites, Activision. Activision Blizzard, actually, uh, trading at ticker symbol ATVI, closing today about 39 bucks and some change, up about nearly 2%, so not a bad day for good old Activision. This is a pretty active one, doing nearly 18,000 contracts a day. Today, doing 51,000, 50 to 1 calls over puts. 
that should give you some idea of kind of what we uh, what we saw out here. And of course, it was a big week for the gaming sector as well. And forgetting about everything else that's going on in the space, they had their big E3 conference. Not surprising to see an, a gaming name on the list this week. We saw news coming out of Microsoft. In addition to the acquisition deal, another reason why that, that timing of that deal is kind of suspect. They had other big news coming out that same day from E3 and new hardware and everything else like that. So news come out of Sony and all the big publishers, including Activision. So uh, not surprising to see them on the list this week week. And what we saw in particular, uh, again, that 50 to 1 calls over put should give you some inkling of where we were looking. It started off out there in July, the July 39, 40, 41 call fly going up 5 by 10 by 5,000 times, uh, doing it at a, a variety of different prices. Went up in a bunch of chunks over there on the old SIBO. Again, uh, as the day went on, the, the volume came in about 2x that, for so a total of 10,000 by 21,000 by 10,000. So again, a lot of paper going up here, the lion's share of that 50,000 contracts coming up in this one uh, mega, mega spread. It looks like they want this sucker to come in and do naught but hang out at the 40 strike uh, for uh, through the end of July here. And they're putting a lot of size money here where their mouth is. Kind of interesting timing. Maybe like, maybe they didn't like the announcements coming out of E3 this week. Maybe you don't think things are uh, going on out here. This this name used to be one of the more reliable premium sales in the business going into events like earnings and things. Since then, it's been on quite a tear. It's been a little bit more volatile. Actually, a lot more volatile. It's also broken out of that trading range it was in at about the 10 to 14 for a long time. Uh, so this thing's a far more active name than when you used to see a lot of these kinds of, kind of uh, premium selling, kind of pinning type trades going up in here a lot. Uh, so this guy is uh, is looking for uh, some interesting stuff. Mr. Greasy Meatball, what's your take on our friend here? Putting up a size fly in Activision. Looking for the pin. I guess he uh, he's thinking that, uh, you know, all those awesome Activision Blizzard games uh, are going to push the stock directly to $40 a share. And it's going to pin, and he's going to make a ton of, ton of dough. So... Uh, I don't know if that's uh, really the way things are going to work out, but that's what the guy's going for. It's a pin trade. I'm guessing he wasn't too enthused by the new Call of Duty or whatever else they announced at, uh, at at E3 this week. He's like, you know what, Call of Duty in space, I'm not on board with that. I'm going to put on this trail. I'll get a little, we'll get a little bit of a pop to the 40 strike, but no more. And uh, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. All right, moving on to one of your favorites, Mr. Greasy Meatball. This is uh, good old iShares Barclays 20-year Treasury Bond ETF, ticker symbol TLT, closing today, 136.46, up about half a percent on the day. It's another one that does a fair amount of paper on a given day, about 50,000 contracts, doing about 4X that, a little over 200,000 contracts today. Uh, slightly calls over puts, three to one calls over puts. That should give you a little bit of a hint as to where our gaze was drawn here in good old TLT. And this is another bit of a, a funky one. Looks like uh, upside vertical, in particular, the Dece 142, 147 vertical. That's what first caught our eye out here going up. Oh, about 20,000 times, just a tick underneath that uh, for 375 over 241 um went up with two big blocks over there on arca uh we did see a very very similar spread going up uh, shortly thereafter it was the 143 148 of vertical going up 17 nearly 18,000 times i uh, can't recall the last time i saw those kind of legs going up so similarly so close together like that and not being uh, in uh, in one block like that kind of interesting uh, in and of itself. Uh, so yeah, a couple of a uh, couple of funky trades, and looks like they're spreading out. Maybe Uncle Mike a little bit some stupid action here, which should get your uh, your should warm the cockles of your dark dark heart, sir. But uh, yeah, interesting stuff here, Mr. Greasy Meatball. What's your take on? Looks like a bit of a, a bit of a funky dece uh, stupid going up here, vertical stupid here in tilt. I mean, it, well, TLT is that long, that long vol trade. I mean, I, I don't. I'm kind of shocked at at what at the way the vol has just popped here. After they basically just torched vol in bonds for the last three months, uh, the bond vol has been parabolic in how much higher it's gone. 
And so, uh, you know, it's it looks like it's some some hedging and some trading against uh, potentially, you know, lots and lots of Fed action. Uncle Mike, what are your thoughts here on uh, one of the rare occasions of your favorite? I know your own personal favorite strategy. All your clients money is in this, which is uh, the vertical stupid. What's your thoughts here, sir? Raising his ugly head yet again. Well, yet again, Mark Longo acknowledges another opportunity for the stupid, the closet stupid lover. I love it. No, I, I agree with Mark in that I think this is some type of uh, uh, hedging with the Fed, and uh, I really don't see anything else that it could be, quite honestly. You guys are no fun. I wanted some fun point counterpoints on the stupid here on the show, but uh, we'll, we'll let you off the hook for here as we move on to our final name, for the old odd block today, this is uh, good old Wells Fargo, ticker symbol WFC, uh, closing today $46.85, pretty much unched on the day. This is the name that does about 33,000 contracts. So we have a, a litany of fairly high volume names in the odd block today. We usually talk about 300 contract a day, $5 biotech. So this is a, a fun treat. Uh, doing about 2x that, actually, no, about 3x that, about nearly 100,000 contracts going up on the street here today. Uh, about two and a half to one calls over puts. Uh, that, once again, should give you a bit of an inkling of where our attention was drawn yet again. In particular, it's like a bit of a time spread slash roll. Started going up nearly 15,000 of the July 52 halves. Uh, going up looks like <coughs> excuse me paper buying versus a total of about 16.5 on that strike against open interest of nearly 40,000 hence our belief into the roll and then against that we see them rolling out to the aug 50 strike looks like paper selling doing that for a nickel and 43 cents respectively so our friend here taking a short looks like it worked pretty well for him off the table readjusting and doing it can't get his 52 half strike anymore guys it has to go all the way down uh, to 50 but he clearly is willing uh, to do that again uh, wfc hovering right south of the 47 handle right now but this one fairly uh, fairly opportunistic this wells fargo was trading north of 50 just about two weeks ago so so this could easily break through uh, and be north of the 50 handle pretty quickly our friend here not so concerned doing that for 43 cents, a net 38 cents on the roll. Again, only about 3,000 contracts open on the AUG 50s. So open in paper here, Mr. Greasiest of Meesey, Greasy Meatballs slash Business Show people. Uh, what's, uh, what, what's your take here? You know, I think that, uh, I don't know. It's, uh, give me a second here. You know, this isn't a bad little trade. Uh, if you... You know, it's I like it. I like it a lot. If if you think the financials are going to move, uh, it's a it's a nice little trade. So you think thirty eight cents rolling out to AUG and the fifty strike? None of that is uh, none of that is raising your ire. You like all of it. You know, yeah, I'll take. Uh, you know, this isn't bad. This isn't bad. Now, it, the, obviously, you're paying up, but uh, it's not too bad. Not too bad at all. I don't know. I think your counterpart, the Rock Lobster, would take umbrage. So I'll take umbridge on his account just for fun. All right, feel free. Uh, <laughs> all right. That's going to do it for the old odd block. Now it's the time for you guys uh, to fire off with some questions, some comments, uh, some insights, some hilarity of your own. Because it's time. It's Thursday. It's time for the mail block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for The Mail Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Mail Block. Like the name implies, this is indeed the portion of the show where you guys get to take the reins and direct the focus of our conversation here. And no shortage of ways for you guys to do just that. You can hit us up, of course, on the website, probably the easiest place. It's all baked in there, including the website feedback form. Also hit us up via social media, twitter.com slash options or options insider on the options insider, excuse me, on Facebook or options insider on stock twits 
or hit us up the old-fashioned way, questions at theoptionsinsider.com. And, of course, if you are streaming it, you could fire them into uh, the chat, or a lot of you I know like to lurk in the chat but post elsewhere, Twitter or Facebook. You can do that as well, and we'll try to rope them into the show if we have uh, some time. All right, we got some, uh, got some, got some ones ready to go here. Let's start off with this question from, uh, from Mr. or perhaps Mrs. Vegan. They write, hey, for an options newbie, how would I construct a trade with the most possibilities to win? I understand that the potential profit might be small. Uh, what time frame is good as well? This is why I love our listeners. They kind of want it all. They want it all rolled up into a very neat, delicious sandwich. We can stamp a bow on it and give it to them in uh, just a handful of seconds. Of course, there's the obvious way we can go, Mr. Uncle Mike, which would be to advise them on some sort of -of out-of-the-money premium selling, but that is far too risky for an options newbie. I'm sure you would concur, and it'd be just terrifying, and then they're going to fall in love with writing out-of-the-money puts, and it's going to work, and it's going to work, and it's going to work until it doesn't. And uh, then, of course, they're they're left rolling a $50 million loss and getting attacked by the SEC. So, Uncle Mike, let's start there before we go down another dark corner. What do you have to say for our friend here, Mr. or Mrs. Vegan, looking for the golden ticket? <clears throat> the golden ticket. Well, I think the... The way with which I like to explain, if you're the basic of all basic of option trades would be to just buy a deep in the money call or a deep in the money put, uh, and then just kind of monitor it and have a stop loss on it. Uh, The benefit of that is it's the simplest of all option trades. Uh, Of course, the disadvantage is that they're a little bit more expensive, uh, meaning you'll have to pay for more premium. But uh, the other benefit I'm sorry. The, and, and, and the other risk, of course, is that a lot of times the bid ask spreads are a little bit wider. So I think when you're first starting something, I think the best way to go in the option world would be to just simply buy a deep in the money call or a deep in the money put. And if you look at the trade you want to make and the spread is uh, $3.40 by $6.80 or something like that, then I, I would paper trade it then just to get a feel for it, see how it's working. Uh, and then go that route. So I would say the first way with which to go in an option trade, just take a small amount of cash, go deep in the money. Interesting. Deep in the money, a call or put buy. Interesting choice. I kind of like that approach. A little bit different, a little bit farther afield. Of course, the nice thing about that trade is once they get on board with that, it lures them into all sorts of other fun strategies, including uh, one of our favorites here on the network. Call it... uh, a synthetic covered call, even though I had a debate about that on a show yesterday, about that exact terminology, or a fig leaf, as our friends over there in, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in their, uh, excuse me, in Trade King, uh, like to call it, or all sorts of other names for it, a diagonal, whatever you want to call it. But they can, of course, turn around with that in the money call. Again, depends on how far out they do it. This is usually a little bit longer term trade, so somewhere in the six plus month, maybe to a year range, 70 to 80 delta, and then they turn around and they can write that front month, or even if they're aggressive, the weekly calls, and they have that effectively, that synthetic quote unquote covered call, uh, which is always a fun trade and a good way to juice it up, but that's not maybe not for the newbie. You want to start with that deep in the money uh, types trade, pretty much some sort of stock replacement, or if you buy the put, a uh, short stock replacement. Interesting stuff, interesting choice, Uncle Mike. I probably wouldn't have gone there, which is why I tossed you first. I know you'd have some sort of uh, out of left field suggestion, which I appreciate. Keeps me on my toes. And speaking of out of left field, Mr. Greasy Meatball, when someone comes to you guys over there in the land of the pit and they're hanging out in your chat and they say, hey, I'm a newbie, and what do you recommend for me? What do you tell them? Don't do anything and start learning. And, you know, or you could be like Karen the Super Trader, sell strangles. Those went all the time. Right. One standard deviation. One standard deviation Bollinger Band strangles. I think I, I can get behind that, sir. Let's do How it. How do you lose? Let's launch you a can't. fund. It's like free money from the internet. <laughs> it's that easy. You play small now, classified um, ads, and uh, you're gonna I make would, a lot of money. I would, uh, you know, what I would say is, if you're a newbie, newbie, don't trade options. Spend some time learning. In fact, and and Mike Tussaud will agree with me, and Mark Longo will too. If you wouldn't trust somebody to trade options with your amount of option knowledge, why are you trading it yourself? Get your act together, do some reading, do some learning, and uh, yeah, definitely uh, definitely check it out. Uh, and definitely check out options, how they work, and learn, and then, then think about trading, you know? Well said, sir. Uh, yeah, you know, it is, kind of, uh, it is kind of hard to recommend that they just uh, dive in willy-nilly 
but still uh, interesting, interesting stuff nonetheless. Uncle Mike, you did miss a grand opportunity, though, sir, to uh, dive in and get all on board the stupid train. Choo choo. So if you want to amend your suggestion, I will give you time now, sir. Well, I mean, that's a more advanced trait that you got to you got to get the platinum level classes at option pit to learn the best way to do a stupid, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> You're missing out. You got you got that webinar teed up. Uncle Mike and the stupids. I'm waiting for it. That's going to be uh, <laughs> all of one person is going to sign up for that. And it's going to be me. So I can just mock you from the cheap seats the whole time uh, on the webinar. Uh, all right. Moving on to another one. We got a timely one. <laughs> excuse me. Coming in here from uh, from Jim. Jim Duggan. Duggan. He writes. FOMC and Brexit are approaching. Well, we missed one of those, but uh, can't get to all of them in a, in a timely fashion. Uh, what are some good ways to use options uh, to play Brexit or FOMC? This kind of goes back to the conversation we were having at the top of the show. You know, these a uh, lot of different things are juiced. We're obviously still very juiced uh, in the marketplace right now, particularly from a downside perspective and a lot of the major indexes. So it kind of depends what your outlook is. If your outlook is, hey, this Brexit thing is way overblown. And I was talking to some people earlier today who kind of are in that camp. They made the they made the uh, comparison from Brexit to it's the kind of the current Y2K. Uh, if you're in that camp, this is all Sturm und Drang signifying nothing, then hey, you got a huge premium harvesting opportunity in front of you. Uh, if you are so inclined, perhaps in the S&P, you want to do some downside put spreads to get into a level where you're comfortable buying the S&P, you're going to get a much more attractive rate than you were even a week ago uh, at those puts. So that's certainly a, anything that takes advantage, any sort of thing that has a premium leg there uh, is so inclined. If you're more a little more exotic, a little more hardcore, we were looking at some of the currencies uh, this morning and how they're lining up. Unfortunately, if you're kind of betting against the pound, uh, you want to bet against the pound uh, using options. You kind of miss the boat. Those puts in particular are juiced to the gills, to use a technical term. Uh, so everyone and their mothers bought uh, bought the puts out there already. So you kind of miss that boat a little bit. Again, if you want to fade it, though, maybe there's opportunities for some verticals out there taking advantage uh, of the premium that's being won out there. So there's a, a lot of crazy ways you can play this. We were talking earlier just in the odd block about someone uh, someone using the old TLT uh, to do something similar, uh, you know, fading uh, some of the recent moves out there as well. So it depends on kind of your your level of macro view and then what product you like to play. Uh, you could go to gold. You can go to Uncle Mike's land if you want to fade uh, this kind of stuff as well as the FOMC. Uh, so it kind of uh, it depends kind of where you're looking. Uncle Mike, we have a broad purview for this one. Uh, so where would you suggest our friend Jim play uh, maybe, maybe one of each, maybe one to uh, to fade the Brexit slash FOMC, kind of give us both, and then maybe one if he is uh, if he's if he's pro Brexit. All right. So first off, in honor of Hacksaw Jim Duggan, I am going to recommend a two by four ratio. Of oh, some I didn't sort. even think about that. That's right. He's Hacksaw. That's that's awesome. That's hilarious. <laughs> Good catch. <sir>. Oh. <laughs> so. With that, so if it's not hacksaw, if it's hacksaw, Jim Duggan, do something in a two by four ratio. I I don't know what, but something in a two by. I four. like to believe but, in a world where hacksaw Jim Duggan is listening to our show every how, week. How That's great fantastic. Would that be if hacksaw Jim Duggan's like, oh yeah, you know I like to trade flies versus ratio spreads. It's the best. All we're missing is uh, the old school Ultimate Warrior. May he rest in peace, and a few others. And, oh uh, yeah, we could we could get uh, the American Dream. <laughs> we could have ghosts of all the great dead wrestlers of the 80s, and it would be an awesome show. Uh, you know, we'd have Randy Savage, of course, uh, Andre the Giant, Junkyard Dog, I believe he's not longer with us either. Yeah, it's been a rough road for those guys. <laughs> all right, save us, Uncle Mike. Save us some of the dark talk yet again, sir. What you got for us? Okay, so let's say that you believe implied volatility is going to come down uh, after the, the Brexit announcement. You think it's going to be a resounding meh. Of course, the most basic thing with which you could do would be to do a sell an at the money call and sell an at the money put. And then, of course, the, the announcement uh, proves to be no market movement, volatility comes out, and life is good, and you are a genius, my friend. That's the most basic way with which to do it. Unfortunately, the bad part about it is if you're wrong, uh, then naked means naked for a reason. You're going to wish Hacksaw Jim Duggan was put in the 2 by 4 to your head if that doesn't work uh... for you. So with that, uh, one way with which to do it, uh, that uh, the other way with which you can go if you think it's going to be more of a non-event, I would tend to lean more towards some type of a butterfly trade as opposed to a condor trade, meaning sell that same straddle with which I was mentioning earlier and then buy some wings. Uh, the other thought, if you're thinking it's going to be a non-event, you can sell an iron condor. However, you're not going to get quite as much bang for your buck. Uh, yes, you can 
supposedly rest easy saying, oh, so long as it doesn't move all this amount, I'm okay, and I'll make my 2% over the course of the next couple days. I'll admit, even though I personally hate teeny premium selling, I've looked at some of those far out of the money puts, and it is a bit tempting for me to sell some naked puts on S&P futures, but I will not do it. Uh, so with that being said, uh, that's I, I think that just going with like an iron butterfly or uh, some type of butterfly uh, would be the way with which to uh, trade this if you believe it's going to be a non-event. If you believe that it's going to be uh, a big mover in one way, shape, or form, I always I typically have a hard time buying straddles. Uh, I shouldn't say typically. I always I, I never buy a straddle. But if you do believe that's going to be a big move in one way, shape, or form. I, I can't resist. I got to recommend a ratio spread uh, and that it's a back spread in some way. Perhaps two by four, sir. I think a two by four ratio would be the way to go. Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to do it. A two by four ratio by gosh. So with that, I think that, uh, I would suggest doing a call ratio back spread. If you believe that you're going to, we're going to have a big rally off of this, then I believe that it would make sense to do a ratio back spread in some way, shape or form. So, with that being said, ho! Ho! <laughs> All right, Sebastian, try to follow that up. See if you can work in even more uh, '80s pro wrestling uh, analogies to the to the sure. to the equation. You know, one, how do you follow up such amazing hacksaw, Jim Duggenry? Uh, That's that right, what tough he guy. Said. That was. Uh, I used to love that guy. I, oh, who, who was your favorite '80s wrestler? I mean, I. I I don't know if it was the American dream and his man boobs or, I mean, I liked Ric Flair. Yeah. You got to go with him on a, a seminal moment of my childhood was watching ultimate warrior defeat Andre the giant live in like an eight second match. It was insanity, uh, back, oh, yeah. back in good old Hartford. <laughs> so, uh, well, I the Flair, Rick match. Flair is the man. And if you want to be the man, you got to beat the man. Woo! You got to beat the man. Woo. Well, I remember the Ultimate Warrior versus Hulk Hogan match in WrestleMania six was amazing, even though even the, even though neither of them could wrestle. But you know, I would if I was going to say anything, um, it, you know, in terms of this type of stuff, Brexit, whatnot, I'd be looking at uh, you know I want to Bloomberg and talk about this EWU. Uh, you can do the fourteen thirteen one by two for a small credit. I was looking two at by four, my friend. To the, the, excuse me, the thirteen fourteen long one short two. Uh, two by four, and that will uh, that will pay out well if things drop a little bit. And if Vol comes in, you could probably flip it out for at a credit anyway. Uh, so that was a trade I like. I also just I also kind of like a kind of long straddle position hedged off with some short UVXY or VIX to uh, to make a trade. So those those are two I'd look at. All right, let's think. We got time. How we're looking here? We got time for. One more here. This comes from, I don't have the name here. <laughs> Let's just call him uh, John, John Doe. Uh, he or she writes, uh, uh, do we have any specific strategies near or on expiration to profit from theta decay? Someone coming in looking for the old school expiration trade. We haven't had a Talk, talk about that in a while. That kind of trade, it kind of going the way of the dodo, uh, looking at uh, the notion, uh, this this used to be this grandiose notion of expiration Friday, and the premium harvesters would come in down to the floor, the guys you only see once a month, and that's when they would make their money for the month, and that was the big day, and you could see all the guys in the pit who were short premium because they were sucking on tums the whole day, and the guys who were kind of long or closing out, they were kind of just watching the clock, and uh, it was always a fun day. A big of a bit event. Uh, these days, not so much. Expiration is obviously every Friday, and didn't get to at the top of the show, but now we have the Wednesday weeklies. In fact, the Wednesday weeklies uh, lighting it up there, doing some decent volume setting open interest records, uh, getting up to about 100,000, 100, 105,000 ADV uh, in the Wednesday weeklies alone out there in VIX land on the SPX Wednesday weeklies. So, uh, that, so those bad boys lighten it up as well. So now we have Wednesday expiration they've already filed for a monday expiration so that's kind of forthcoming as well so what i'm getting at is that pretty soon every day is going to be uh, expiration quote unquote friday 
uh, which is kind of one of the many reasons I'm glad I'm not in the brokerage business right now. When you have expiration every day, uh, it makes uh, it makes things all the more uh, crazy cakes when you're talking about all the fun stuff going on. All right, getting back to uh, John's uh, question, specific strategies. We know there's all the the usual suspects we hit on those before. Mike was talking iron flies before. Those are clearly uh, iron fly at the money. That's a high risk, high reward proposition. But if you are so inclined, you want to maximize your theta decay and you don't mind playing close to the fire, uh, that's all the fire, baby, right there. And <laughs> I had the money iron fly. You like things a little bit gentler, a little bit more, uh, a little bit more risk averse. You can spread it out a little bit with, of course, the old iron condor. Again, uh, you're going to have some, uh, some, some tender moments there towards the end of the day, uh, but it's a little bit farther away from the at the money. You can, of course, uh, you can sweat it a little bit easier and, of course, always straight up verticals and things like that. Again, if you're profiting from decay, you got to have some sort of short leg in there. Uh, you're not buying options to profit from decay. But any of those kinds, if you want to, I've always been a fan of the old iron fly, but again, it's not for everyone. Certainly not at all. Uh, if you like sleeping at night, then perhaps the iron fly, not for you. I'm Uncle Mike, I was surprised to hear you recommend an iron fly recently. Maybe you're, you're coming over the dark side along with me, sir. Well, if you want to be neutral, I've always been on that dark side. So um, I, you know, I'm typically not a fan of the expiration day trades, although I must confess I did put on a one-day option trade today and ended up getting out of it today. Just I ended up selling a put spread when the market came down today. All right, who are you? Ended, day trading, iron flies? I, I don't know who you are anymore, sir. You're dead to me. <laughs> I do about one day trade every six months. It just kind of happens, but either for better or for worse, and thankfully today it was for better. But uh, I just could not resist the high vol on the 203 half put uh, when SPY was around the 206 level I could not resist and uh, the fact that I was able to buy the 198 half put for uh, gosh like eight seven cents or something like that I could not resist all of that so I, I I took on the trade so uh, typically the day before expiration or expiration I, I try not to play that game because it, it just becomes a coin flip and then if you're doing it on indice a lot of people think that uh, the old SPX trade, and then they think that, oh, okay, I'll be okay, and then they go into settlement, and then they realize settlement is uh, basically what settlement is, a, is accounted for throughout my career is a lot of painful phone calls uh, to the broker when a, a retail client doesn't understand settlement uh, with uh, SPX options. So I typically tend to stay away from those unless it's just something where I really feel it's going to be beneficial. Uh, if I were to do it, it would be the parameters that I've set forth on the show a million times of doing my weekly put spreads. And only when you have vol as high as we have it right now and you're able to sit by the computer and eat your tums as I did today, uh, then I would do it. But typically, I would say I, I like to stay away from stuff like that. Yeah, it's never been really my, uh, all my joking about iron flies aside. I was always the guy down on the floor. I'd be running around, closing out any remnants I had that were short or anything around uh, the at the money come expiration day. I don't care if it was in the S or Intel or wherever it was. It just was not my game to come in there and try to ride a bunch of uh, theta going into the close and, and hope for the best. Uh, they're easier. They're, you, can, you can get an ulcer many ways down there. You don't need to accelerate it uh, by adding that to your strategy. That said, John Doe, it sounds like they want to play with a little bit of fire. So, uh, hey, have at it. Mr. Uh, Mr. Greasy Meatball, take us home. What are your recommendations or perhaps warnings for our friend, uh, Mr. Doe? A, B, C. Always be closing. Always be closing. So I'm in agreement with you, Mark. Always shut that stuff down. Shut it down, shut it down, shut it down. So you're telling him don't do it. Don't do any theta trades on expiration Friday. I, I mean, unless you want to sit there and babysit them all day, why? I mean, you have to babysit an expiration trade. So if you think you're going to make enough money where it is worth it for you to sit there and just stare at your screen and pray that you're right, by all means, go ahead. Otherwise, don't be an idiot. That's another probably way we could coin this, uh, the babysitting trade, because you're totally right. This is the kind of trade you got to sit there and stare at your screens and do not but pop tums and chew your nails and Uncle Mike not even go into the bathroom, have a little can under the desk and all sorts of fun stuff. So that sounds like fun. If that's worth your time, that's the way you like to trade, then have at it. Uh, but yeah, a lot of people may uh, <laughs> may question that approach over the long run. Either way, great questions. We got to keep rolling. Time for our final segment, Around the Block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. 
All right, everybody. Welcome to Around the Block. Like the name implies, this is indeed the portion of the show where we tell you what we're watching uh, for the rest of this week into the old weekend. And again, not a heck of a lot uh, this uh, coming week. It's really all about the old B, the hashtag Brexit on the 23rd. That's what's driving a lot of the volatility out there in the marketplace now. And I guess it's up to you whether or not you want to fade that or you're buying into it or what the deal is. It's kind of a, uh, an either-or uh, scenario at this point. A lot of the polls coming out of England saying leaning maybe towards the uh, getting the heck out of Dodge vote. Uh, we'll see how that comes to pass. we still got a couple of weeks to chew this one over. I'm sure things will get a lot more frothy and a lot more fun before it's all said and done. That said, we turn our attention to the greasiest of meatballs and businessiest of business show hosts, Mr. Greasy Meatball. What are you watching for the rest of the week into the weekend? You know, I'm going to be watching that Brexit vote. I, I think it ends up being much ado about nothing, but it is going to drive things. Uh, I'm going to be watching, um, you know, we don't have a lot of economic stuff, so I'm not really there. So I think that we line up for a face ripper of a rally next week at some point. Uh, something you know, akin to what we saw today, only coming starting from zero. So we get we get another run back over twenty one hundred. I think I think we're set up for that because there's some there's some nastiness happening. There's a, some potential for a nasty move up or down. My guess is that move is up down for vol <laughs> up down, for up down for vol yes up for the market. Easy for you to say, sir. Uncle Mike, sir, what are you watching for the rest of the week into the old weekend, sir? Oh, I'm just so excited now. I get to say the word Brexit one more time. Uh, of course, the Brexit. Uh, I, I don't think there's really anything else that's going to be uh, driving the market over the course of the next week or so. So I am laser focused on the Brexit. And of course, uh, the 205 magnet on SPY, which seems to have been the case for, uh, oh gosh, at least the last 50 years, it seems, no matter what. You, you look at SPY, it has to be at 205 at some point in time. All right, listeners. That music means we've come to the end of yet another excellent journey here on the option block. Started off in the realm of uh, FOMC, got into Brexit, uh, got through a whole bunch of crazy uh, back and forth in the odd block and a lot of uh, debate on what the heck was going on out there. Moved on into a bunch of your crazy questions where we talked a lot about 80s wrestlers. And indeed, coined some new terms, which is always fun. It's been quite the journey, but now we must bring it to a close. But before we go, one last time, let me check in with each of my cohorts here, my partners in crime, on the old all-star panel. We had a lot of guests on the show of late, and they're always fun, but it's good to have uh, the old crew back on here together. Starting with Uncle Mike, what's cooking in the land of RCM alts slash RCM wealth advisors? I'm going to give you the pro wrestler special today. If you call me or email me, I will talk 80s pro wrestling with anybody anywhere, and I have more knowledge of 80s pro wrestling than anybody, with the exception of the wrestlers themselves, than anyone else on earth. So if anyone calls me and wants to talk pro wrestling, done, we'll do that. If you want to go beyond the conversation and discuss financial management in one way, shape, or form, feel free to contact me. I'm uh, happy to work with anyone, uh, even if you have just a couple hundred bucks a month to invest or something like that. Because of how scaled I am, I can give you the time to do it and do it right and help you in any way with which I can. Uh, feel free to contact me at 312-212-3531 or send me an email at m2saw at rcmfs.com. Can I take you up on that, calling you for the uh, the pro wrestling, 80s pro wrestling chat? That sounds yeah. like fun. <laughs> Anytime. I can't talk anything beyond, like, 1990. Don't ask me any. I don't know who the heck any current guys are, but I can talk Junkyard Dog and Macho Man all day mm -hmm. long. I know all those Superfly guys. Superfly Jimmy Snooker. Oh, yeah, another I one. I still have the complete set jail. of WWF yes. cards. I think Superfly he Jimmy cards. Snooker's in jail Yeah, I think he, he murdered did someone, that? didn't he? <laughs> yeah, he murdered someone. has not been I a good run. Out. Oh, he did? got out on that. Wow. Did he fly the coop? Badum bum <laughs> yes, 80s trivia listeners, uh, 80s wrestling uh, trivia. Why are you looking that up, Mr. Rock Lobster? Or excuse me, Mr. Unc Mr. Greasy Meatball. What's cooking in the land of the pit? Tell us about this event you have coming up. Uh, well, we've got our big event coming up, the uh, July Pro Trader Summit. Uh, we're going to have all sorts of speakers from myself, Vince Bora. Uh, we're going to have uh, Steve Primo, uh, all sorts of awesome people. We're going to do a live podcast of the option block uh we might even do a live podcast of the business show if you're lucky and uh there's gonna be just uh we're gonna do a cubs game all sorts of fun stuff 
And so uh, you, uh, if you look in the show notes, there's a link to get yourself registered. And uh, it's a good way to support uh, the show and get to hang out with me and Mike and Mark and uh, come out to uh, come out to dinner with us as well. So uh, the link is in the show notes and uh, come check us out. Yeah, let the Greasy Meatball buy you a steak. It's the tastiest steak you'll ever have. I guarantee you, listeners, when it comes from the Greasy Meatball. All right, on behalf of the aforementioned Greasy Meatball and Uncle Mike and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading and streaming and subscribing. And, of course, for tuning in live. We love you guys as well. And we'll see you next week for more of the Option Block. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. 